This is not the time to worry about inflation. The enemy is still there. I definitely support more investigation into the origins of the pandemic. I am concerned, though, that, you know, that this turns too adversarial. We have an issue with Airbus that we need to settle, or Qatar Airways will not take any deliveries from them. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Francine Lacqua in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Global stocks start a new month near record highs, but could concern over inflation force central banks to take their foot off the gas. We speak with Jim O'Neill on the shape of the recovery. Italy eases restrictions in the latest big test for Mario Draghi. This hour, the world-famous restaurateur Massimo Bottura joins us to talk resilience in hospitality. And will China's moves to rein in the surging yuan shift the dial for investors? We get the latest on the PBOC policy. Well, good morning. Lots ahead in today's program, including an imminent conversation with the Chatham House chairman, Jim O'Neill. I know he wants to talk maybe about football, but more than football, we'll talk about BRICS and, of course, the recovery and what kind of markets we'll see. First, though, it's a new month, so let's get straight to the markets with our Danny Berger. Danny, happy June. Happy June, Francine. And finally, we're away from the month where apparently rhymes dictate how we trade <laughs> the sell in May and go away. But look, it didn't play out. Seasonality is, of course, important just because if a trend has historically held, then perhaps it will continue to hold in the future. And look, on a headline level, ending the month with a half a percent gain on the S&P 500. But underneath the surface over the past month, there has been more volatility. And this is, of course, important in terms of where we go from here. And that volatility really manifested itself in selling out of tech. So maybe it was sell tech in May, with the Nasdaq 100 falling more than 1%. And within that, we get this very sort of rotational, reflationary type vibes. You want to sell the higher value stocks. This is something we'd heard earlier in the year. The narrative kind of muted, but really did come back last month, even though it was kind of hard to tell day to day because it was very volatile. And you had small caps, for example, doing well. Of course, the other way to look at this is in factors as well. So let me take you into my terminal. Because, you know, Francine, I'm never too far from the FTW function. That's factors to watch on your terminal. And when you look at what did the best over the last month, you have things like size, for example. So these are smaller ca caps that we're talking about. Value. So value does really well and starts to come back. And on the bottom, you have things like momentum. Um, growth as well, not as high up on the list. So you get this clear rotation. Now, in terms of where we go from here, the thought is, is that this can continue, at least when it comes to UBS Global Wealth Management and Mark Hayfully, uh, who basically says that the setup is there for this market to keep going. So let me show you what he said. He makes three points, really, in terms of why this will continue. One is just the economic growth we've seen. Of course, what happens on Friday with the jobs report could maybe change this picture. But so far, the economic recovery has been clear. We've also had earnings growth in the U.S. and globally, where companies really surprised to the upside. And finally, if the Fed is going to stay supportive, they're going to let the economy run hot. That means that this sort of reflationary trade can continue. So, Francine, at least the consensus at the moment is what we saw in May may continue to repeat itself in June. There you go. Okay, Danny, thank you so much. Uh, Danny Berger there with uh, some wise words that actually get put to test. Now, investors didn't sell in May and go away after all. The dodge comes from the idea that in the summer months, market activity drops as traders go off to the beach. Clearly, that isn't easily done in a post-pandemic world. Now, the key question for investors now seems to be whether rising price pressures will prompt central banks to withdraw support sooner than expected, this despite the pandemic still raging in some parts of the world. Now, yesterday, we also heard from the OECD raising its global growth forecast for 2021, warning that the recovery is uneven. Now, in a recent article for Project Syndicate, my guest host, Jim O'Neill, said, although some recent high-frequency indicators have cast a shadow on what previously appeared to be robust, rapid recovery from the pandemic-induced recession, there's still ample cause for optimism. But much will depend on how well policymakers and the major economies manage the foreseeable risks. Well, let's get straight to Jim O'Neill, Chatham House Chair and former Chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Jim, as always, thank you so much for coming on and what a brilliant article that you wrote for Project Syndicate. What would be the, the biggest policy mistake right now? Oh, gosh, that is a really tough question to start off with, Francine. Thank you. I, I know. Um, no, no icebreaker. I think that I think that's a I think the toughest uh, thing that the, the biggest mistake would be for them to, to rush to do anything. I think uh, 
a lot of what we've seen has been, even by the standards of some of these high-frequency indicators, uh, surprisingly predictable. Uh, I, have, I have to say, especially after seeing these Korean export numbers uh, a couple of hours ago, I have never seen anything quite like it from the indicators I've followed for 30-odd years. Uh, astonishing cyclical recovery going on. But when you sort of stand back from it, whilst it might surprise people that aren't um, more used to, you know, this kind of intensity of, of high-frequency changes, I, I think the policymakers should be careful about rushing to what many in the markets are, are trying to persuade them that it is now a done deal that underlying inflation is back. Obviously, the very latest readings we had in the US suggest it could be, but, um, you know, one month is one month. So, but I, that said, I think the it heightened attention on as many anecdotal indicators about wage behavior and, and, and with it pricing behavior by co companies to make sure they've got a handle on the inflation expectations process is crucial, absolutely crucial. And I, you know, I, I, I remain unsure myself whether we are seeing a real pickup in inflation or not, and it, it could be. But uh, uh, yep. clear, what is clear, another, th another three months, say, of, of this intensity of global recovery and central banks are going to have to start thinking about uh, reversing their easing. No two ways Jim, about are, are it, if, if it stays like are, this. If it stays like this, but it, what, is the danger that we're underestimating actually how effective vaccines work longer term or variants? Or do you think we're pretty much, you know, it's hard actually being in the markets because we're not virologists. And so it's difficult to see <laughs> how this kind of, you know, where it ends up. Well, the answer to that is nobody knows, Francine. Uh, you know, even though we're 18 months into this pandemic, each twist and turn, uh, it, nobody knows quite what happens. They still don't know, for example, here in the UK, what is the virulent strength of this so-called India, or now rechristened as of this morning, the alpha vaccine, uh, alpha variant. Um, it looks to me, and, and as you know, I'm quite involved in some of this health stuff, so I'm following a lot of the numbers really closely. It looks to me as though after an initial scare about 10 days ago, the, the rate of increase in overall infection in the UK is leveled out. But, you know, that's just on the basis of the last few days. But I think, you know, here we'll need another week or so. The UK in some ways is on the cutting edge of, of countries to follow because we've mm -hmm. had such a very large vaccination rate. And this variant seems to be more uh, evident here than in other countries, at least from what I can tell. So I think by uh, the beginning of the second week of June, when the British government will decide about opening up more, we, we will see pretty clear signs whether this uh, virulent, uh, vi new virulent spread is, is, is causing a lot of damage or not. But we'll have to just keep having an open mind, as one always has to do yeah. about a lot of information. So, Jim, what do you think that the market should be looking at? I mean, apart from inflation, which I imagine is 90% mm -hmm. of their time, if not like 100%, is there something else? Is it, you know, not volatility, but liquidity that we should worry about or something else that makes you uneasy about the summer months? Well, I, I, I tuned in to catch the, the intro to you, or the end of the previous discussion and the intro to yours that, um, you know, it is... It is quite clear within sectors of the equity market, things have got a lot more volatile. And uh, if we see a fresh bout of nervousness in the bond market, then that's going to create issues about liquidity as well as more vol volatility, because it is the time of year that we go through. No, nobody's ever fathomed out quite why you have this regular thing every every late spring going through the summer. But uh, I have to say I have some sympathy with it this year. And, and even though the overall S&P index managed to eke out a small gain uh, in May, it probably didn't feel like that to many managers because it was just so volatile. And, you know, we've got, we've got a tricky couple of months coming up because it does look to me as though these indicators are going to be extremely strong around the world. And... Mm -hmm. uh, marginal central bankers will be shifting from being uh, as friendly as they were. And it, it's not impossible that they might start to send messages about some sort of preemptive 
they wouldn't call it tightening, but removing of, of the scale of liquidity. So it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be challenging. But at the end of the day, focusing on measures of in, inflation, and as I think I, I made reference to in the piece you cited, something that I believe for a long, long time, that, that the five-year University of Michigan inflation expectation survey in the U.S. is highly powerful yeah. in terms of its durability and its, its true reliability. So I'm going to be watching that. Yeah, I remember actually saying it last time, so we paid special attention to it. Jim, so I came in and actually our head of economics reminded me that you coined BRICS 20 years ago, which made me feel really young. Uh, leaving that to one side... On my forehead. Do you, think your, do you think your analysis has held up? Is there something that, you know, that has structurally changed, actually, how we should be looking at them? Well, obviously, the second decade for uh, Brazil and Russia has been uh, a bit of a disaster. So, as I occasionally joked about, maybe uh, maybe it should have been called X, uh, because those two haven't fulfilled uh, what what the scenario painted could happen. Uh, that said, if you look at the aggregates, because China dominates it so much, uh, the reason why the whole concept became so popular is because we said. Uh, that by uh, the middle of the next decade, the BRICS could become bigger than the G7. And that's still possible because of China. And despite endless dilemmas and challenges and these waves of really bearish mood about China, China keeps sort of, I, I was going to say, sort of plugging away. But it, it's obviously more than that by, by global standards. Uh, China looks like it's going to eke out something close to 6% growth this year. Uh, and that's more than we assumed as part of the BRICS story would happen this decade. So, and as you touched on also, the exchange rate is very strong. So in dollar terms, that's translating into an even bigger rise of a share of global GDP. And India, despite its enormous cyclical problem, looks like it's coming through the worst of this infection rate and will probably yeah. bounce back just as quickly as everybody else. So... I, you know, is it is it still the same way to describe the thing? I mean, you you know, I I I, I can't be the judge as well as the <laughs> theory creator. That would be a conflict. But feels to me feels to me everybody talks about it still, and the BRICS political leaders meet all the while, and these guys collectively have an increasingly large share of global GDP. So, uh, and as we as we'll see when it comes to global governance, which is where the idea all came from. The G20, which includes all of them, because it includes yeah. all of them, is a lot more relevant for truly global problems than is the G7, which the UK is about to host. Wonderful. Jim, thank you so much. Jim O'Neill there of Chatham House stays with us. We'll talk a little bit more maybe about BRICS or X, and we'll talk maybe about fo football as well. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the program, we discuss the Italian reopening with the head chef of the three Michelin star restaurant Osteria Francescana. He's Massimo Bottura. He's coming up shortly. But up next, we continue our conversation with Jim O'Neill. If you have any questions for our guests, you can just IB plus TV go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacway here in London. Now we're back with Jim O'Neill from Chatham House. We're talking about BRICS. We're talking a little bit about China. Jim, when you look at China and actually also the adoption of a possible uh, digital yuan that could be a, a game changer, not for now, but longer down the road for China, how do you see this you know, China-U.S. relationship developing? I think it's going to continue to be uh, tricky. Uh, it's quite interesting to see in the past week uh, the Biden administration picking up the threads of, of Trump administration focusing on the source of COVID, for example, uh, that's not something I think many of us would have expected. Uh, and, and pending how that goes, that in itself obviously could cause a whole new uh, level of friction. Uh, I find myself thinking that it's, it's probably in China's interest to now be more more open about the inquiry, given the, 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 the frequency that this, is, that this is coming back, because if ultimately it was it was discovered by 
uh, involuntary methods from on China's behalf. That there was some uh, source of it away from this uh, f um, animal market, then that would not be great, to put it mildly, for China. So. Uh, how that progresses in itself, on top of everything that's there beforehand, is is going to be tricky. All of all of that said, if you if you go back to the pure uh, narrow economics of it, if you look at the way China's conducting its monetary and fiscal policy relative to the rest of the world, and an incredible contrast to 2008 coming out of that mess, China's being almost Swiss-like in its caution which one would imagine longer term is probably pretty good for all, yeah. for all things China relative to the rest of the world, I would say. Jamie, we also heard from Emmanuel Macron asking if the U.S. is still spying on EU leaders. I mean, that story, mm. is it expected that, you know, this has to do with Denmark and the fact that maybe they, they were helping or facilitating the spying of Angela Merkel? Is this something <laughs> that we should not be surprised by? Well, I only ever worked in the Treasury in my extensive 17 months in government, not not in the Foreign Office or the Security Services. But that said, I would guess the reality is many countries are constantly spying on each other in, in different levels of, uh, of intensity. So, I, 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 you know, I, I can't imagine that the French don't spy on other countries that are allies of theirs either, to be honest with you. But there again, let me quickly add, what what the hell would I know about that? <laughs> All right, you know a lot about football. Did you spend much of the weekend watching football? <laughs> uh, listen, my, my team is doing so poorly and, and, and got humiliated <laughs> in the sort of lower lower class European trophy last week. The only consolation we got from this season is that, A, it's finished, and, B, Manchester City didn't win the trophy that really matters. So there are, there okay. are endless uh, funny uh, cartoons going around about how Manchester City can't... Hit, get this on, uh, on Bloomberg Live. It'd be, there's a fantastic thing from Patrice Evra taking the mickey out mm -hmm. of Liam Gallagher about City not winning the European uh, <laughs> Champions League. It's very funny. <laughs> OK, we'll get that in the next 20 minutes. I mean, does, does your, you know, does your f football need, the, does Man U need a new manager then? Oh, that's a bit harsh on Ollie. Manchester United needs okay. new owners. Man Manchester United needs new owners, better purpose uh, and a connection with someone. You know, I, I think I've discussed with you before, certainly written about the past two yeah. months. Uh, it epitomizes the need for s some in some parts of business to have profit uh, with, a, with a purpose. Uh, the Ma Manchester United machine is driven purely by the motive of profit. And uh, you see the negative sides of that unfolding as, as the years go by. And the resulting dissatisfaction from Manchester United fans is only too evident mm -hmm. to see. And you see some of the consequences of it playing out on the pitch. Um, one of the one of the key uh, members of the family is, suppo is supposedly meeting with the fans forum of United fans later this week, and uh, mm -hmm. if there's only a token gesture of, of a shift uh, shown, then we're going to get more disruptions because United fans have had enough of this style of ownership. And it, it you know beyond the sort of amusing side of us talking about it in a football context, this is, this is highly relevant to. The broader issue of how business develops in coming months and years as we come out of this yep. pandemic, because we need to make sure that there's more winners uh, from the way capitalism is being uh, evolved, not not just from those that can sort of organise a sort of oligopoly or monopolistic yep. type control. Jim, thank you so much. Always fun, never dull. And you even have me talk, speaking right, about Fran, football. Jim nice to see you. Chatham House Chair, as always, joining us on a number of issues, including football. Now, coming up, China's yuan is on a tear, reaching its highest against the dollar for three years. Now, China is taking measures to slow the run for the first time in more than a decade. We'll have the latest next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix right here in London. Now let's quickly check on the markets because there's quite a lot going on. Coming up, we speak with Enda Curran about Yuan and some of the movements there uh, that we saw. The other big one, of course, today is OPEC. Now OPEC has, as always, the ability to move a lot of the emerging market currencies depending on what they do with oil. If I'm looking at the European stock 600, they're gaining some 0.5%. I look at cyclical shares and they're actually up. Again, it is uh, the week where the European Union plans to lift all quarantine requirements starting in July. Also, pound jumping to a three-year high as traders cheered the rollout of vaccines in the UK. Now, he's a man who runs one of the world's best restaurants. He has taken Italian cuisine to new heights, and he joins us to talk about the Italian reopening. Coming up, we speak to the chef patron at Osteria Francescana, Massimo Bottura. If you have any questions for him, just IB plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Stocks start a new month near record highs, but could concern over inflation force central banks to take their foot off the gas. Italy eases restrictions in the latest big test for Mario Draghi. World-famous restaurateur Massimo Bottura joins us to talk resilience in hospitality. And while China's moves to rein in the surging yuan shift the dial for investors, we get the latest on PBOC policy. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, China is forcing its banks to hold more foreign currency in reserve for the first time in a decade as it attempts to brittle its surging currency. Taiwan has gained 13 percent against the dollar since last May, fueled by China's economic bounce bank and its high-yielding markets. Well, joining us with the very latest is Enda Curran, our Bloomberg chief Asia economic correspondent. Uh, good morning to you, Enda, or good afternoon for you. What's the significance of the PBOC's move on the yuan? Well, Francine, I heard it described as a shot across the bows of the banks here. It's not intervention in the yuan per se. China isn't directly intervening to bring down the strength of its currency or anything like that. But it's a technical measure. They're, they're asking banks to hold aside now 7% of the foreign exchange in reserve. That's two percentage points higher. It's the highest since 2007. And what it means in practice is that it will take take dollars off the table and put some downward pressure on the yuan. As you mentioned, the yuan has been on a tear against the dollar in recent months. And uh, while China isn't explicitly intervening, they certainly want to send a signal that, look, this one-way bet can't go on forever, that they're not especially happy with where the yuan is, and that at some point it's going to have to come back down. How effective and that, you know, is this move going to be? Well, it's quite a technical measure. A lot of analysts this morning were saying that, look, it's not going to be a game changer. It will take steam out of the yuan at the margins. You know, it will require banks to keep money to one side. It's nothing, it's nothing like the shock that we saw back in 2015, for example, when they shook up the, uh, the trading mechanism for the yuan. And China also will have to tread a bit carefully here because, you know, they're trying to send a signal to the world that the financial markets are wide open, they welcome foreign capital, they are committed to freeing up and liberalizing the currency. So they don't want to be seen uh, to be on the global stage as deliberately now stepping in to, to manipulate their currency per se to help exporters and the like. And I, they also have a practical issue in that China is importing a lot of inflation at the moment on the commodity side of things, a lot of tradable prices, and a strong exchange rate helps keep a lid on that. Uh, the flip side, of course, is that it does hurt profits, especially for smaller exporters in China as well. So there's no doubt China has a lot to balance when it comes to Yuan's exchange rate. This particular move is somewhat modest, but it could be a signal of uh, keep an eye on this space and see what other kind of policy levers the, uh, the government does pull over coming months, Francine. Enda, thank you so much. Enda Curran there, Bloomberg's Chief Asia Economic Correspondent, joining us with the very latest on what could be one of the biggest stories mm -hmm. of this year and beyond. Now, as the rules of economics are rewritten by COVID, one of the places that's most felt is in the labor market. Massive job losses, furlough schemes and flexible working are just some of the themes that emerge from the past 18 months. This week sees the World Economic Forum hosting its Jobs Reset Summit, where leaders will examine the future 
of the way we work. Well, joining us now is Zahadia Zahidi, World Economic Forum Managing Director. Zahadia, I'm also looking forward to the forum because I'll participate, I think, tomorrow with a wonderful panel. And this, you know, is the biggest headache as we get out of our, you know, into the recovery phase out of the pandemic. It's actually many people have lost their jobs and it's unclear what the jobs of tomorrow will be. Is this actually probably the, the, the most common policy would mistake would be leaders not retraining their workforce to make sure that they can have the jobs of tomorrow? I think this is one of those areas of challenge where there is remarkable consistency, regardless of who we speak to, as to the nature of the problem. So we just launched today our chief economist outlook. And the area that they are most concerned about is long-term economic scarring due to bankruptcies as support measures are pulled back. And second, long-term scarring in the labor market. All of that leading towards that K-shaped recovery. You get a very similar picture when you speak to, for example, chief human resources officers or labor economists, exactly the same worry. So the good news is we know what the problem is, but it is going to take more than reskilling. Reskilling and retraining is going to have to be a big part of the solution. But the second thing that we're going to need is a medium term focus on actually investing in the jobs of tomorrow. I think a completely passive approach on the part of policymakers is unlikely to work. What are what do you see, Sadia, as the jobs of tomorrow? So we've uh, been mapping out across seven big sectors what the jobs of tomorrow are likely to be. One big area is care jobs, you know, a big win-win for society. These are jobs that are needed because of demographic challenges and changes, but these also happen to be big areas of mass job creation. What we need is higher wages, better certifications. A second big area is the education sector. So reskilling itself is likely to provide a massive job creation opportunity. A third is, no surprise at all, the digital economy. And within that, you've got sort of a whole set of areas around cloud computing and AI and machine learning specialists and data analysts, just a massive area of growth. And then there's a number of others that relate to a new kind of customer service, new kinds of um, marketing, uh, new kinds of HR related roles. All of these are big job creators. And then, of course, not surprisingly, the green economy and all of the jobs associated with that. What governments will need is to ensure that as their stimulus packages try to build these markets of tomorrow, there is an equal effort on building the jobs of tomorrow. And that requires a slightly more directional, slightly more prescriptive approach than we currently have to reskilling and upskilling markets. For those that are already inside companies, this is going to be fairly easy to do. But for those that will be wholly displaced and that will be looking for new opportunities, there's going to need to be more guidance provided by governments. Um, Sadia, is there a government or a region that actually gets it more than others that are doing this right and are looking at the transition the correct way? No, Francine, you're not going to be surprised when I give you the Nordics um, as the example, right? So these are governments that have for quite a long time put human capital and sort of the, the software of the economy at the heart and at the center of what needs to change if their economies are going to be ready. They are again doing a fairly good job of using the sort of basic flex security system that exists to on the one hand have a relative level of flexibility on the labor market and to combine that with security for workers and to try to preserve work and workers and their income rather than to simply preserve specific jobs. They're again doing a fairly good job of managing the shift that's currently underway. But across the developed and the developing world, this is going to have to be a set of practices that are embraced by everybody. Um, Sadia, I mean, I, I know a, a lot of the forum will also be not, you know, not only on the scarring and, and kind of these new jobs that are being created, but I guess the, the work from home or the flexibility in work and approaches. And do you think that's something that will change the way we live and work because of the pandemic? Or is there a chance that actually even our economies go back to the way it was pre-pandemic? There's an interesting bifurcation going on at the moment in a lot of the white collar workforce that has been able to work from home over the course of the last year, the big debate is really about what level of return to the office is going to happen. Is it going to be full return to the office? Is it going to be fully stay working from home in a very flexible way? Or will it be a hybrid? The large majority of companies, particularly in Europe, are ending up in that hybrid space with at least two to three days of minimum in office presence. 
The other part of the workforce is really those that have not been able to do much of their work without in-person interaction, who over the last year have been sort of bearing the brunt of the front end of this uh, health crisis or have had to be um, essentially out of work. Now, that's where you're seeing some of the most interesting developments. New jobs are being created, but workers are not necessarily ready to rush straight back into work. In part, that's because of the support they're currently um, uh, receiving. In part, it's because vaccination programs are not complete. But in part, it's also because many workers are asking themselves, is this worth it? And they might be looking for more of an opportunity to either reskill away from that in-person workforce or to see if um, their employers are going to offer them higher wages. And that's where you're going to see that upward wage pressure in some of those that frontline work. Sonia, I know you've done also a lot of work on economic development. Are, are we looking at a more balanced, balanced and equitable future for countries and also populations within countries? Or, again, is it going to be the same old mess? You know, much of what we've been talking about so far is about that within-country K-shaped recovery. It's about the rising inequality. For the first time in about 20 years, you're seeing that the middle class is shrinking and you're seeing that poverty levels are rising. But this is also playing out at an international level. There is, again, for the first time, the risk of a major divergence between developed and developing economies rather than the kind of convergence that we've been aspiring to. In part, this is pre-pandemic trends. It's because that old model that was on the basis of competing um, with cheap labor or aspiring to a sort of manufacturing-based uh, development model, that's been going out the window for some time, and the pandemic has just made it worse. And so those economies will have to think very differently about some fundamental investments in education, on digitization, on human capital uh, build out within their economies and using a very different growth model in the future. But some part of this is really because of the pandemic. These countries don't have the fiscal room to have provided the same kind of support to their workers, to companies, and to have had the same kind of healthcare response. And that is where measures that will provide vaccinations to uh, developing economies and measures that will provide a lot more support so that they can shore up their economies will be critical. That is the only way to avoid the risk, not just of inequality within countries, but also across countries. Sadia, thank you so much. As always, Sadia Zahidi there, the World Economic Forum Managing Director. Now, he's a man who runs one of the world's best restaurants. He's taken Italian cuisine to new heights, and he joins us to talk about the Italian reopening. Up next, we speak to the chef patron at Osteria Francescana, Massimo Bottura. If you have any questions for him, just IB plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, and also a little bit of restoration today. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, one of Europe's largest economies is finally reopening. From today, restaurants in Italy's low-risk zones can serve customers indoors for the first time since February. Our next guest may be one of the many people celebrating the reopening of Italian hospitality. Well, joining us now is Massimo Bottura, chef patron and owner of Osteria Francescana. Over the years, Massimo has collected a range of accolades that place him among the world's best contemporary chefs. After entering the prestigious three Michelin star club in 2012, Osteria Francescana also won the world's best restaurant award twice in 2016 and 2018, becoming the first Italian restaurant to do so. Now, in 2011, Massimo himself was also voted amongst his peers as the most innovative chef around the world. Massimo Bottura, welcome to Bloomberg. And he's also great, you know, great energy when speaking to you. I could not be more excited yeah, anyway. to having you Thank on you. the program. <laughs> Ma thanks Massimo, how excited are you? Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Actually, we, last year, we got also the four star, the Michelin uh, green star for the sustainable uh, restaurant. You know, that to me, it's a very innovative, but in the perfect period, uh, you know, to get that kind of star. Because we need aesthetic, close to the aesthetic approach to food. 
Yeah, and this is because you, you have always actually, you know, not, I don't know if it's slow food cooking, but you've always tried to source things really around where yeah. you serve customers. How excited are you of having customers back in your restaurant, inside, <laughs> indoors? As the first day of school, you know, you imagine, I, we are all like, oh my God, what's going on? Uh, we are, but, uh, you know, I was very focused uh, during this period uh, to to use uh, this precious time because I have to think uh, always positive and uh, and I'm responsible for 150 first people here in uh, in Modena with uh, between uh, Maria Luigia, Francescana, Franceschetta, Cavallino, Food for Soul. So we are 150 people, the family, and uh, I was responsible for everyone. So I had to take care of the apartments, I had to take care of food, I had to take care of the salary, because you know the Italian government is like kind of struggling, especially with companies they, they think are very healthy and things. So yeah. I took care of everything. So I stay, I stay extremely energetic, uh, try to involve- yeah, engaged. All, yeah, we, and engage uh, all my well, team uh, in creative exercise. So I've, have you thought about, I mean, a lot of, I've seen a lot of your recipes also on social media. I'm sure you, you kept engaged also with, you know, some of the new things that you will uh, bring to the people that have booked. But is there a new way of business, of doing business in hospitality because of the pandemic? Uh, yeah, of, of, of course, uh, you know, the all hospitality change. We need to be more focused on the real the reality, the real thing that is about restaurants. So restaurant means restore, restore the soul of the people. So first thing is like a big smile, hug people with uh, in, a, in a very warm way and make them feel home. In Maria Luigia, we did uh, this and, um, you know, uh, our country in the, you know, we want everyone who come and visit us to feel home and it's home away from home. So it's what we want to do. And, uh, but for Osteria Francescana, it's a different approach. Osteria Francescana, we opened the reservation at 10 o'clock today for December. Yeah. We already fully booked. So it's like, uh, it, it's different, you know? I knew it was something that we had to just start again. And, uh, but uh, uh, the thing is, uh, we keep evolving. And now we have a new yeah. menu that starts today called with a little help from my friends. Dedicate to Surgeon Pepper to only our club band, but also to all the historic Italian gastronomy from the 50s till now. And it's like, it's going to be explosive. You are the first one who knows about this because I didn't tell anyone. I mean, I don't know if it's the pictures we're seeing, but I have to say the, the newsroom and the people watching are pretty excited to also have this sneak peek about, you know, what the chef is proposing. Massimo, when you look <laughs> at uh, how your industry will adapt and how difficult is it, are, are you going to have less people inside? Uh, do, do you have to take more measures and precautions? Or does it actually, you know, do people feel comfortable enough just because of some of the fantastic things that you were just talking about that really no yeah. one else is doing? Yeah, no, um, for us it's like, uh, it's always been uh, an approach to gastronomy of qu on quality and not quantity. Uh, that problem uh, will be for, for big restaurants, no? big numbers. For us it's always been, uh, at the top we want uh, 30 people, uh, 30 guests. Uh, as we do in Casa Maria Luigia, as we do uh, in, uh, in the other restaurants. So it's not, about, uh, it's not about the quantity, but the quality. The quality of the ingredients, the quality of the idea, the quality of the service and the hospitality. And the power of beauty. We are, we are like, we try to create uh, beautiful places, but not just for the, just for the uh, three Michelin star restaurant. Even our project Food for Solo, Feeding the People in Need, it's about beauty because uh, our soup kitchen are, they have one thing, full of art, architecture and design to share with everyone.
Mas, well, actually, I remember visiting one of the soup kitchens, and some of the things that you've done ha has been pretty extraordinary. Do you worry that you know the legacy of the COVID crisis will be more people in need, and actually even more restaurants closing down? Is it the restaurants that just couldn't cope, or is it restaurants yeah. that would have closed down anyway? Uh, I think uh, most of them uh, they would close down anyway. Um, most, uh, some people in need, yes. The request for people coming to refectorio, for my personal experience, pr uh, probably they double. Uh, there's a lot of, there is a class that was like, they lost the job, workers. Uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna be trouble, you know? There's gonna be trouble in the moment uh, uh, the Italian government is gonna reopen the possibility to, for the companies to, to fire people because there's a, an excess of uh, uh, workers and uh, that, that's going to be that's going to be trouble I think but uh, you know uh, as we always did I'm extremely uh, uh, positive on uh, a, a, a yeah. re, re, try again and solve the problem through our managing the irrational, as we always yeah, did yeah. Uh, as Italia. And Massimo, are, are you fully booked for all your restaurants? I'm not, I'm, asking, I'm not asking for a friend, although I could be, but actually, are, are you suffering from, you know, tourists not being able to come to Italy at the moment because of various quarantines? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, we're, we have a very high percentage of uh, booking. Um, uh, but we keep, uh, you know, we keep doing. Uh, Osteria Francescana Via Stella um, is, uh, is uh, something uh, that is completely fully booked till 31st uh, of, uh, 30, 30 of December, because uh, last day of the year we didn't open yet. Um, mm -hmm. We have, uh, we have uh, Osteria Francescana at Maria Luigia, that is uh, my jewel, this uh, uh, farm <laughs> that I rebuilt. Uh, and uh, I create 12 rooms, two apartments, uh, a private villa. During this pandemic, you know, I didn't know what to do yeah. with all my energy, and we did this. And uh, so we have a new it, shot, Massimo. Yeah. So great. And actually, so many viewers are asking. So there you go. Now we have the answer. Call Massimo and get yourself booked in. Massimo Boutour, <laughs> as always. What a great, no, great pleasure. In Maria Luisa, to speak in Maria to Luisa you. no? In Maria Luisa, we cook in front of the people. So we broke the walls. In the world, in, in the, the world that, where everyone wants to build walls, we broke the walls and we decide to cook in front of the people. So the guests are part of the experience in the evening. So it's unbelievable. It's an incredible feeling, you know? Massimo, because you are, this in is... the meantime, we are plating, people are coming and join us with uh, telephones, with cameras, and everything. And they are part of all this. It's amazing. It's a new Massimo, approach. Massimo, it's wonderful. Thank you. There's like a politics parallel. I need to get you back on. Massimo Bottura there from Osteria Francescana. European stocks actually on the rise. I'm looking at the European stock 600 gaining some 0.9 percent to cyclical shares higher. OPEC also sur or oil surging on the back of OPEC later. This is Bloomberg. This is not the time to worry about inflation, the enemy's still there. You can't forecast these things. And even if you could forecast where inflation is, you don't know what the effect's gonna be on the stock and bond markets. We're not going back to the 1970s, but it's just so clear that this is more than temporary. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. Well, good morning from London, Berlin, and New York on this Tuesday, June the 1st. We're in June. Our top stories today. The British pound takes a breather while sterling backs off a bit after rising to a three-year high. Traders still betting the UK's economy will take off as more people get vaccinated. Beijing steps on the brakes. China makes its most substantial move yet to keep the yuan from getting stronger. 
And say goodbye to the oil glut. To Brent rises above $70 a barrel after OPEC and its allies predict the global market will tighten up. We'll talk with the head of the International Energy Agency, Fatih Birol, shortly. Now, there is quite a lot going on in the markets also because we took a breather yesterday. So we look at pan movements, we look at dollar movements. And Kaylee, of course, underpinning all this is not only inflation, but what OPEC does will yeah. maybe filter through that conversation as well. Yeah, of course, commodity prices have everything to do with inflation, Francine. We will await that supply decision, which could come today. And, of course, we get a slew of economic data here in the U.S. throughout the week as well. Of course, it is the first trading day of June, and where that left us in Asia was mostly positive. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index at its highest in more than a month. Even though Japanese and Australian equities were just a touch softer, the outperformance was really led by Hong Kong, with the Hang Seng up more than one percentage point. Of course, as you were saying, Francine, really interesting story in China when it comes to the yuan taking a bit of a firmer hand trying to rein in that rally by lifting the reserve ratio for foreign exchange holdings for banks to seven percent and after that the yuan is slightly weaker against the U.S. dollar sitting at 637.48 also in foreign exchange I would note the Aussie dollar is stronger against the U.S. dollar even if offsession highs after the central bank left policy unchanged. As for what the picture looks like here in the U.S., futures are pointing to a firmer open to start the month. We are up about four-tenths of a percent on S&P E-minis, and we're seeing some selling in the Treasury market with yields moving higher by about two basis points on the 10-year to 1.61 percent. Of course, it is OPEC day, and ahead of that, WTI crude up three percentage points above $68 a barrel. That is the highest since October of 2018. Even if more supply could be coming onto the market, the fact that the cartel is saying that that tighter global market market is taking shape that supply glut going away uh, seems to have traders optimistic and then of course coming off of a long weekend here in the U.S. we thought that may mean incredible volatility for Bitcoin and we didn't really see that happen it actually rose Sunday and on Memorial Day yesterday that Monday it is just though slightly down today to below thirty six thousand dollars Matt. All right so uh, a little bit of a breather for Bitcoin as well you guys took breathers yesterday I was here of course, European markets continued to trade, and it looked like at the beginning of the session today that um, we were going to see uh, a drop for the FTSE, and even U.S. futures were down. That's turned around a little bit. We got a ton of um, economic info out of Europe. We started out this morning with German inflation ticking up higher than had been estimated. Now we see European inflation just coming out also higher than had been estimated, rising to uh, 2%, a solid 2% from 1.9%. And Italy boosting its GDP forecast now to actual growth rather than contraction as the economy there reopens. That's something that we're going to talk about throughout the program. Take a look at the stocks today. Markets are climbing and the DAX is ra rallying up more than 1% right now. So German markets a little bit stronger than the rest of Europe right now. But we see gains in France, in the UK, on the Iberian Peninsula. Everybody up today. I also think it's interesting to see the euro gaining a little bit of ground back on the pound. If you look here, you can see euro pound at 86 pence. I keep very close track of this because, as most people know, I've been waiting to buy this used Ducati S4RS in Sheffield, and I need my euros to gain a little bit more strength against the pound before I can make <laughs> that deal. A couple months ago, it was down below 85 pence. So as we gain ground, I'm closer and closer to coming over to the islands and picking up that bike. Um, you all see Volkswagen. So much news around Volkswagen, Francine. You've got um, Business Insider reporting that they're close to making a deal with their former CEO, Martin Vinterkorn, on clawing back some compensation after the diesel scandal. You've got Handelsblatt reporting that they're thinking about an IPO of their battery unit. And then you've got um, Reuters saying that the Porsche and Peach family would take big stakes in Porsche in case of a Porsche IPO, no matter how unlikely um, that is at the moment. So a lot of news around Volkswagen, and they're the biggest gainer on the DAX index right now. I would love it, man, if you went to get your motorcycle because I still don't understand the tax system. So if you, I mean, if you get it here in the UK oh. and then drive it back, presumably you don't get taxed. But I, I mean, I've bought coats in France and then get taxed more than if they were shipped to the US and other times I didn't I pay think tax. I would get taxed. Unclear exactly what happens. I Even think, I, well, he, the thing is, 
I could dr I would drive it back myself, obviously, but then I would feel guilty. I wouldn't want to get caught. You don't want to be a tax cheater, especially in Germany. It's really frowned upon. So I would have to yeah. announce it, uh, declare <laughs> it. I'm, I live on the honor system, as right. you know, and then I'd have to pay like 20 percent. Yeah, more than the, I mean, more than you know, tax cheater. I just don't 100 percent know what the rules are, and a lot of customs I have not figured out since Brexit. So we'll look at deeper exactly what the right way to pay tax is. Now, look at what else is ahead apart from the tax debate and cars being moved from the UK to Germany. NATO foreign and defense ministers meet virtually today in a summit chaired by the Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. The BOE governor Andrew Bailey will speak at the Reuters Global Responsible Business Conference. Also, the Economic Club of New York hosts the Fed Governor Lael Bray for a webinar and finally OPEC plus meets to review oil production plans the alliance is expected to continue reviving output which is why we're looking at of course the price of Brent and WTI almost on an hourly basis now uncertainty continues over the outlook for the pound sterling now pulling back after sitting around the strongest level in three years that's as traders make bets as to how much traction the vaccine program will have on the economic recovery well joining us to discuss this is Danny Berger Danny un let me if you look at what's driving the markets partly it's vaccination but partly it's maybe dynamics with dollar. It, it absolutely is. And, and you're so right. And that's why it's so difficult to get this clean narrative because it doesn't only matter what happens in the UK, the rate story, the economic improvement story. It's really important how that fares relative to the rest of the world because, of course, this idea of a stronger pound, which around here was trading at a three year high, had to do with the idea that the BOE would move sooner than the Fed, would move sooner than its other developed market peers. Um, of course, that story, we, we don't know certainly that that's going to be the case. Yes, the economic outlook is improving. The vaccinations are gathering pace. But MPC members, they really are just laying out scenarios at this point, saying, OK, if employment looks really good, uh, then that's when we get perhaps earlier tightening than had been expected. But we don't know that that's going to be the case. Now, the economic optimism picture at its highest since 2016 in this survey of businesses. But you'll note it really happened, that plunge, uh, that pair in gains from the pound happened when markets opened at 8 a.m. when you finally get cash trading in equities back in the market. People are finally back from their holidays. So it really was in the most uh, uh, voluminous part of the market trading at the open that we saw this fall in cable. So, I mean, it really is just going to continue to hit these resistance levels despite the fact that the trend is higher and the economic picture is brighter, Kaylee. All right, Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you so much. And let's keep the conversation on foreign exchange because China is forcing its banks to hold more foreign currency in reserve for the first time in over a decade. That's as the PBOC makes its most visible attempt so far to rein in the surging yuan. Let's get more from Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent Enda Curran. Enda, what's the significance of this move from the PBOC? Well, it's something of a shot across the bows. It is not direct intervention by China's central bank. They don't want to be seen to be doing that. They don't want to be accused of deliberately cheapening the currency. But nonetheless, they are clearly concerned that the strength the yuan has been on a tear now against the dollar, three-year high. And what they're doing is fairly technical. They're telling banks, look, you must keep 7% uh, of your foreign exchange in reserve. That's two percentage points higher. It's actually the highest since... 2007. And while that won't be a game changer for the yuan, it does mean that it will put a bit of downward pressure on the currency. But the signaling effect is what's even more important here. The central bank is trying to tell traders and tell the world that look, this one way appreciation tear that the yuan has been on cannot go on forever. It will co come to an end at some point. The central bank clearly doesn't want to step in and intervene. China is trying to sell a message that it's welcoming global capital, that it's the markets are somewhat open for business. But at the same time, it's reminding everybody who's in charge here that they will keep an eye on where the levels are. And clearly they have some thresholds that they don't want to cross. So, you know, as it was as it was described earlier today, it's something of a shot across the bows. It's not a game changer for the yuan, but it could be the first step uh, in other policy steps that will follow over coming months. And it's certainly going to be a space to watch very closely. All right. Enda, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Enda Curran there talking to us about what's going on in China. Now, in terms of global oil, Brent is climbing. NYMEX is climbing as OPEC Plus prepares to meet in Vienna to discuss supply policy. Will Kennedy joins us, Bloomberg News executive editor, editor for Energy and Commodities. And, Will, we already know that their view on supply is more bullish, I guess, if, in price terms in the second half. 
That's right. I think that most people's calculations see the uh, oil market tight and, and tightening, that the call on OPEC oil uh, will increase in the second half of the year as uh, demand recovers around the world, driven by a recovery from the uh, pandemic. Um, so in terms of today's meeting, I think that means that they will rubber stamp a decision to put more oil into the market in July, about 800,000 barrels a day, um, some from Saudi Arabia and some from the rest of the OPEC plus coalition. So that will almost certainly happen at today's meeting, um, continuing the pattern they've set over recent months of slowly uh, putting supply back into the market. The bigger question and what we'll be looking for is what happens after that. At the moment, they're meant to hold production steady until early next year. But given how tight the market is, they may want to look at increasing production more. The big unknown is Iran. What happens at today's Iran talks and when does that Iranian oil come into the market? That will be also weighing on discussions today. So we'll be looking for any comments on that. Yeah, definitely a big question mark on the Iran issue. Will Kennedy, Bloomberg News Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities, thank you so much. Now I want to take a quick look on some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. And one big mover to the upside is Cloudera, the software company. This is on reports that KKR and CDNR are looking to take the company private at a $4.7 billion valuation. That's about a 24% premium to the last close. Shares are higher by about 18% in early hours. I also have to talk about one meme stock that has been on a tear. AMC was up 116% on the week last week. Reddit traders coming in and buying, and that seems it's continuing this morning. The stock up 10% wow. in pre-market trading. One mover, though, to the downside is CureVac. It did release positive results from uh, its COVID-19 vaccine trial, but says it has to continue in order to get more data. Apparently, investors were looking for a little bit more positive uh, information out of the company, and th that stock is down about 4% before the bell as a result, Francine. Yeah, we're always after more positive news on <laughs> anything to do with vaccine. Thank you so much, uh, Kaylee. Now, coming up shortly, Christian Nolting, Deutsche Bank, International Private Bank Chief Investment Officer. I know we'll ask uh, a thing or two about vaccines, of course, how that moves the recovery phase. And then a little bit later, we'll also discuss OPEC and oil with the IEA Executive Director, Fatih Birol. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Francine Lacqua in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, um, I got a little bit deeper into what we've seen happen with Sterling here. This is a long-term chart going back five years. And what it shows you is that we're getting closer and closer to those 2018 highs, which were uh, 143.77 in dollar terms. We've come off a little bit today, but we've been making a push over the last few trading sessions. Um, so definitely one we're going to be watching very closely. And then, Francine, I was digging into the tax implications of bringing used Ducati uh, across from Sheffield back here to Berlin, it looks like I may have to pay 10% duties, customs, plus 21% VAT, which makes me think, you know, forget about it. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> well, there, there you go. Save money. Save money. It's the German way, Matt Miller. I mean, it's a great conversation. Actually, I mean, we need to look at duties because if, for me, at least, it's unclear with also some, you know, certain exportable goods. And it's a really interesting conversation because it affects everyday life. Now, Christian Nolting, I don't know whether he's thinking of shipping, you know, some transports, whether it be Ducatis or something else, uh, but he is looking at the markets. He's Deutsche Bank International Private Bank Chief Investment Officer and Head of Investment uh, Solutions. Christian, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. First of all, how difficult is it to understand exactly what the pandemic and the huge stimulus does, not only for inflation, but for the world economy, for business and therefore for equities? Yeah, well, I think the, the first important point is to understand we had this massive drop and now, fortunately, a substantial recovery with vaccines going ahead. I think we need to look through a little bit, right? What's after this? So you see that drop, then that spike, and that's true for growth, and that's true for inflation. I think to look through this is not very easy, but you need to have a clear picture about this. 
So what kind of inflation do you expect Germans to be willing to put up with, Christian? It, normally, you know, um, people in this country, culturally, they're very much afraid of inflation, but it, it looks like things have really changed. I mean, getting rid of the black zero, getting rid of the debt break, they're ready to borrow and spend. Um, and if the Greens come into office, that could get even more pronounced. What is your expectation? Yeah, first of all, you're right. Inflation has always been, if you talk to clients, to people here, is the big fear. I think that has changed a little bit. Uh, obviously, Germans are also ready to have more exposure to equities, which is remarkable, I think. We have not seen this for many, many years and decades. I think from an inflation picture, indeed, uh, we could, uh, let's say, expect that Germans are a bit more relaxed about inflation because they also see that financial repression, which is there, is still an issue. And I don't think that will go away, by the way. From a spending perspective, yes, if in September we get a new government where the Greens would be part of, which is quite likely looking at the polls right now, maybe their spending, yes, still, it's still to be expected that the deck break is coming back. I've not heard that this will go forever. It's just intermediately, uh, let's say, withdrawn. But at this point in time, I still think it could come back. So, Christian, if you're looking for a little bit of protection against inflation, where do you do so? We're coming off the best month for gold since last July. Is that a good hedge here? Well, we still like gold as a hedge, but I won't uh, see a lot of price appreciation in gold for the time being. I think there's also quite some correlation to the currency side, uh, if you look at dollar, for example. And we've seen gold also coming down because of the environment getting better. I think in the tough days of last year, gold did have a quite good, uh, let's say, inflation protection view. I think from a perspective of the portfolio, I think equities, in a way, are positively correlated uh, really to inflation that's something to look at and then maybe you put a hedge on the equity side as well so you build mm. some exposure there if you don't have i think that's uh, that's quite a good hedge and then you have uh, let's say tips you can have uh, inflation protected bonds as well so that's something to really put into the diversification of a portfolio from my point of view um christian is there a sweet spot for the price of oil for you know not only the world economy but actually markets well, it's very interesting to see what the OPEC now is really deciding on. From my point of view, they will increase production and reduce the cuts a little bit, but not massively. And that's why I think oil will stay at quite high levels, with demand also coming back in the second half. I think that's what's to be expected. And from that perspective, there is a link into inflation, because inflation expectations are still built uh, substantially on oil prices. So if we see oil prices around these levels, I think it's it's quite a sweet spot for markets. I would say you see some inflation coming up. It doesn't force the central banks to immediately act. If oil prices were, let's say, 10, 15 percent higher from here, I think we are out of the sweet spot. And then there could be a discussion on higher inflation, central banks acting faster, and uh, that could be out of the sweet spot from my point of view. All right, interesting. Christian, thank you so much, as always. Christian Nolting there, Deutsche Bank, International Private Bank Chief Investment Officer and Head of Investment Solutions. Now, coming up on Bloomberg Technology, Mike Novogratz, Galaxy Investment Partners Chief Executive Officer. Look for that at 5 p.m. in New York, 10 p.m. in London. He's been really pretty fantastic talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Now let's get the first word news and Iran has produced a record volume of highly enriched uranium that could be turned into fuel for a nuclear weapon. That's according to the IAEA inspectors. Their report comes as diplomats try to revive an agreement to rein in Iran's nuclear program. Talks in Vienna are now in their eighth week. France's President Emmanuel Macron demands to know if the U.S. is still spying on EU leaders. He was reacting to reports that American intelligence monitored Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel and other European politicians with the help of Denmark. The Danish are among the U.S.'s closest allies in Europe. In tennis, women's star Naomi Osaka has dropped out of the French Open because of a dispute over mandatory press conferences. Osaka said in a social media post that she has suffered from depression and social anxiety disorder. She says that taking part in press conferences makes matters worse. Osaka is ranked second in the world. 
And Bank of America plans to bring all employees in Hong Kong and mainland China back to the office by the end of June. That makes the bank one of the first global lenders in the Asian financial hub to push for a full return. B of A will issue a 30-day notice period as well as return to office training for all staff. And of course, here in New York, top managers are returning to the offices today, June 1st, Matt. Yeah, returning to the office today. Everything's opening up, it seems. You know, we've got Italy's opening up. I'm sure you guys have been partying like crazy in London and New York. <laughs> now, Germany, uh, in Berlin, the Senate today is voting on reopening indoor dining as well as gyms. I'll be doing one, yeah. but not the other. Matt, I have a guess which one You know one what, the thing is. is that if you go back to the office or go back to a restaurant, there's like that social awkwardness at first where you kind of mm. say, do I say hello to people? Do I still wear the mask? So it's fun. It's, it is a little bit like the first day back at school after a long <laughs> holiday. Coming up, Ed Clissold, Ned Davis Research Group Chief U.S. Strategist. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Francine Lacquer in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Katie Lines in New York. Now, Matt, I know we've been looking at uh, importing, exporting Ducatis here and there, but actually <laughs> there is uh, some pretty good news in terms of virus in Germany that they've actually, I guess, de-escalated the risk factor. Yeah, um, the risk previously was super high and now it's just high. <laughs> so things are getting better here. No, to be... Um, a little bit more transparent, we have, I think, 35 infections uh, per 100,000 people over the last seven days. Um, and we had reached a high of, you know, well over 150. Mm -hmm. So things have improved drastically. And maybe that's just part of what happens in the summer. You know, people are outside more, less together. As We've established before, I'm not a virologist, but it seems like in those kind of environments and economies, um, the virus is less of a problem. Yeah, I think when you're outside, it's safe to say, although I'm not a vi virologist as well, but it, it seems to be the kind of, you know, the, the message from the WHO. Kaylee, I mean, this also has an impact on the markets because, of course, we saw, for example, Pound briefly touching a three-month yeah. high on the back of, you know, vaccinations in the UK really going to plan. Yeah, and while the risks in Germany around the virus may not be super high, European equities are super high. In fact, they are actually at an all-time high today, the first trading day of June with the stock 600 up 1%. And here in the U.S., futures are pointing to a higher open in about four hours' time with S&P E-minis up about 18 points. Some selling in the Treasury market were up about two basis points on the 10-year yield to 1.61%. And then, of course, we are awaiting that OPEC plus supply decision, that meeting happening today. And ahead of it, Brent Brent crude is actually climbing towards $71 a barrel right now at 7074. With those gains in oil, it does look like energy could be an outperformer on a sector basis in today's session here in the U.S. The Energy Select Sector Spider ETF is higher by about 1.6% in pre-market trading. And some other stocks moving to the upside as well, one being TripAdvisor, higher by about 3.5%. The company's CEO was actually on Face the Nation's uh, CBS's political uh, show on Sunday talking about that domestic travel recovery, and that seems to be aiding sentiment. Stellantis is also higher by 3.5%. They are resuming production this week at some of their plants in Michigan. And then, of course, have to check back on Cloudera, reportedly being looked at taken private at a $4.7 billion valuation by KKR and CDNR. That stock is higher by 19% in early hours, Matt. I'm glad Stellantis is resuming production mm -hmm. because you have to wait. I think the waiting list to get a, a Ram TRX truck is over a year now. Oof. So they can't make them fast enough. And the margins are so fat on those. Uh, I'm looking at, you know, one of the reasons that they had to stop production was the chip shortage, but also commodities across the board um, have just been more and, and more expensive to purchase. Um, but it looks like hedge fund managers are reducing their bullish bets on commodities. Now, if you look at, Kaylee, what you were showing, all the commodities that we're tracking are up today. Iron ore is ripping face. But hedge fund managers last week reduced their bullish bets on 20 of the 23 commodities tracked in the Bloomberg Commodity Index. So it looks like at least the smart money thinks we may be peaking. Joining us is uh, right now to talk more about this, 
Ed Clisthold, Ned Davis Research Chief U.S. Strategist. Ed, you know, the, the, the main question when it comes to these commodities, when it comes to those Ram TRX pickup trucks, when it comes to um, gas and chips is, are these price spikes that we're seeing just transitory or are these higher prices here to stay? Ultimately, they will be transitory. Uh, you know, a lot of it does have to do with with supply stocks and, and pent up demand. But uh, if you even look over the last 40 years, uh, when we've been in, in this disinflationary environment, when uh, inflation has ticked higher than than the than the trend, uh, stocks have struggled. So if you look at just the CPI, which is an imperfect measure, but it's it has a good history. If if you look at it versus its five year average, when we get over one percent above the five year average, stocks have struggled, and we're well above one percent above the five year average, about two percent above the five year average. So even if it is transitory, it could still be a hiccup for stocks. So how do you invest post COVID? Do you look at small caps or value stocks? Yeah, so the value trade, I think, still has longer to go. Uh, it, it's obviously been going on for a while, but you know, there's two aspects to value. You have the cyclical value, you know, financials, industrials, materials, energy, and those have been working, and we still like those areas. But then you have the defensive value, utilities, staples, and those areas have been struggling because you know they're low beta. So in, in the first year of a bull market, when stocks are ripping, you don't want to be in low beta. But those types of sectors may actually do a little bit better moving forward as the pace of gain slows. So there's a whole other aspect of value that could be coming uh, in, into favor in the next uh, few months. And we still do like small caps. Um, we'll probably look to exit that trade uh, because once you get deep into the second year of an economic expansion, small caps tend to uh, start to underperform. So it's a trade we, we have liked, continue to like, but, but probably won't have for too much longer. Ed, how much of the good news is already priced in, though? Yeah, I think if you look at sentiment, uh, probably a lot of it. I think from here, it depends on how much earnings continue to be, be revised upward. We've had the biggest upward revision on record for S&P 500 earnings. But if you look at lots of sentiment composites, you know, surveys of individual institutional investors, even just asset allocation, you know, we're basically at record high stock percentages, plus you throw in the... Uh, the the meme stocks what they've been doing lately you know it's pretty clear um, you know a lot of people who want to be in the market are, um, are in the market so the the sentiment uh, move is probably behind us and now we got to you know do the old fashioned thing and you know look at earnings and see if that can drive the market higher from here. But is that going to drive the market higher? I'm looking at S&P 500 futures around 42.20 this morning and the average strategist year end target so end of December is 41.99. Yeah, well, as one of those people who have the year-end targets, um, yeah, so uh, it's it's something that probably uh, a lot of people haven't revised yet. Uh, but I think um, the second half of the year probably will be tougher uh, because as we move into, into the second year of a bull market, gains tend to be less. But also, too, when by the time the really good earnings numbers are, are printed, then you have to look forward again. And so actually the S&P 500 has done worse when earnings growth has been above 20% than when it's been, say, even minus 5, minus 10%, because by the time you get plus 20% earnings growth, you know, the good news is already priced in. Everybody everybody knows it. So, And also, it's not sustainable. So, so what we need to see is continued upward revision to earnings. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, the market's going to look forward and say, okay, that was the best of it, um, and, and gains will be um, weaker from here. That's on the stock side. What about on the bond side, Ed? We've been in this range of between 160, 170 on the 10 year for some time. What breaks us out? I find it fascinating that over the last decade, we had three you know, tantrums in the, in the bond market where the 10 year rose by over 100 basis points over a pretty short period of time. And it always happened before the, the event, before the taper, before the, mm. before the actual rate hike. And we had that happen again a few months ago. Um, so now we got to see the next catalyst. I think it's when the Fed gets serious about a, a taper, then we can get a breakout higher um, on, on the 10 year. And maybe it'd be a, a close to 2%. That's what our fair value model suggests where the 10 year could go. But that's probably not an immediate concern. Ed, we've got a great big take on the Bloomberg terminal today saying, you know, maybe this COVID trauma has changed economics forever we're we're now borrowing and spending as quickly as we can and trying to get the money straight to people helicopter money is a term we we used to use the debt amassed by this does that concern you at all 
eventually we're going to have to pay for it. Uh, is it going to be something that's going to happen right now? Probably not. Uh, but if you want to think out so over several years, you know, the long term bull market or secular bull market that started in 2009, you know, that was driven by the Fed and, and printing money. It's probably going to die by the Fed and it's and it's printing money no longer working. Uh, but for now, because of where we are in the economic cycle um, and, and where other inflationary pressures, demographics and the like are probably going to prevent the inflation uh, from being more than just transitory, we'll probably be, be okay. But to think that we're never going to have to pay this bill is probably wishful thinking. Ed, thank you so much. Ed Quissel there, Ned Davis Research Chief U.S. Strategist. Now coming up next on oil and the OPEC decision, while well, the IEA Executive Director Fatih Birol joins us. This is Bloomberg. For generations, there's been certain ways to manage economic crises, and COVID-19 changed all that. Last year, the doctrine of austerity fell to the wayside around the world, and in the new economic approach, fiscal expansion took over from monetary policy. Governments channeled cash directly to households and businesses, running up record budget deficits, and central banks largely played a secondary and supportive role. Even in historically fiscally conservative Germany, policymakers scrapped a rule requiring balanced budgets. The IMF said that the biggest risk to the recovery was that governments would curtail their spending too soon. And in the U.S., the sentiment shifted away from that of the financial crisis. Clearly, no Americans lost their jobs through any fault of their own, and that helped clear the way for a big fiscal response. With interest rates at historic lows, the smartest thing we can do is act big. In the long run, I believe the benefits will far outweigh the costs. President Biden's team has fully embraced a new economic approach. It leans on proposals for higher taxes on the rich, more spending to benefit the poor, and policies that have been largely out of favor since the 1970s. While the response has pulled the economy out of its deepest slump on record, we have yet to grapple with theoretical problems posed by surging growth. And obviously, inflation concerns are fueling a heated debate. Some economists are more worried than others. The highest inflation numbers are just ahead of us. I do think, though, that ultimately it's going to be more temporary. I was on the worried side about inflation, and it's all moved much faster, much sooner than I had uh, than I had predicted. And I think that has to make us nervous going forward. Other economists also say that we already had a generation of macroeconomic policy that was dominated by fears of doing too much. And now the economic attitude seemed to have broken out of that mindset. Lessons have been learned about how to get out of a downturn, and now we have to talk about managing and sustaining the boom. Well, that was Bloomberg's Joe Weisenthal taking a closer look at how the pandemic has made fundamental changes to the global economic mindset. I'm also looking at what we're seeing with oil. I have to say the OPEC Plus Alliance meeting today is probably one of the most interesting in recent memory. Uh, Matt, the oil glut definitely built up during the pandemic is now slowly dwindling away. And we also see stockpiles, you know, sliding pretty rapidly. Yeah, and, and for sure, Joe's piece there, Matthew Bosler's take mm -hmm. on uh, in our Big Take story today plays into that. You know, if the U.S. government is sending trillions of dollars into the pockets of American citizens, they're going to use a huge chunk of that at the gas pumps. They're going to drive as many places as they can, and they're going to fly when that's possible as well. So, um even before you think about the infrastructure investments, yeah. this is adding to um, oil use and the oil price. Yeah, it certainly back. is. Now, coming up, <laughs> <laughs> coming up next on oil and the OPEC decision, the IEA Executive Director, Fatih Birol. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of Francine Lachman London. Matt Miller in Berlin, Kelly Lines in New York. Now, Tom Keen, co anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, joins us. And, Tom, I know you're looking at oil prices. Now, what is interesting for me is, of course, we have the OPEC Plus Alliance meeting later. And it's very clear that the robust recovery that we're seeing in the U.S., but also in Europe, yeah. means that actually they're confident enough to say that the, you know, they can absorb some of the additional barrels that we saw during the pandemic. Well, on June 1, there's an acceleration. $71 Brent gets you to where everybody said the year would start. And then up up, up, up from here. There's different opinions on that. I know you've got Mr. B-roll coming up. Let's look at the chart. This is one of my most famous charts. It's just simply inflation-adjusted oil back 70 years. This is the calm before the storm of OPEC. Up we go, two rounds of OPEC, Persian Gulf dead center in the middle. And then the great oil boom, well above $100 a barrel in 2021 dollars. We've come down and, of course, Francine, a new spike up. Yeah, let's uh, talk about the sky, the spike up. Uh, Tom, thank you, anchor sure. there of Bloomberg Surveillance. Let's get to the man who knows everything about oil. The world has a choice: stop developing new oil, gas, and coal fields today, or face a dangerous rise in global temperatures. That's the bold assessment from the International Energy Agency. Well, joining us to discuss the new roadmap for the global energy sector is the IA Executive Director Fatih Birol. Fatih, we'll look at prices in a second, but just as we transition to this net zero economy in 2050. Do we need to see more about the societal impact that job losses as refineries need to adapt will entail? And good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, what we have done uh, at the IEA is just a simple job of translation. Many governments, EU, United States, Canada, China, Japan, uh, UK, many governments around the world committed themselves to bring the emissions to net zero by 2050. And these are not small words. These are commitments by the heads of states of those uh, governments. And we just translated what that target means to reaching those targets means for the global energy sector. What needs to happen in the energy sector so that the world can reach those targets to avoid the uh, climate crisis. So we, have, uh, we came up with several, more than 400 milestones. What needs to happen in the energy sector and when this needs to happen? Just let me give you a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. In the 20 year 2035, the latest, we have to see 60% of all car sales to be electric cars, 5% from today. Or in the year 2040, 50% of all aviation fuels should be sustainable, non-oil ones. And but as a result of these measures, we look at it, there is no need for new investment in oil, if it is the case right. uh, there. I mean, if you look at the price of renewables right now, how much do they need to fall by to make sure that some of the governments that have put these pledges will follow through with them? Now, renewables are coming very strongly, very strongly. I mean, uh, last year, more than 90 percent of all new power plants were renewables, more than 90 percent. It is going to grow. But renewables alone are not enough. We need other technologies uh, as well, such as the hydrogen, uh, such as the carbon capture. In some cases, nuclear power, advanced battery technologies. There will be a major push for clean energy technologies, and it is the reason I know that you and most of uh, the colleagues uh, following your program are interested in the oil markets. Oil markets and the, uh, the colleagues who are working on the oil markets should be ready for the next bumpy years uh, to come because there will be a big change in the uh, global energy markets coming. I don't say that we will not need oil from today to tomorrow. But uh, big changes exactly. uh, are on their uh, ways. Sure. By, by 2050, things are going to be different. I probably won't be around anymore. But in terms of the next six months, Fatih, we're going to need more oil, right? I mean, um, even OPEC knows that supplies are going to dwindle. Do you expect them to release more production in the second half of the year? And if so, how much? 
Yeah. So uh, I will come to it in a moment, but the, the changes in the oil markets uh, will not be by 2050. It will be much earlier, so therefore it is better of to course. get ready yes. uh, uh, by now. But looking at the next six months, I see that uh, I see uh, very uh, uh, clearly that the, there is a strong recovery of uh, oil demand, United States, China, uh, Europe, and uh, elsewhere. And uh, if the uh, oil producers, OPEC Plus, uh, stick to their current uh, uh, policies, we may see a widening gap between uh, supply and uh, demand. Of course, here is the a wild card, which is Iran. What will happen with Iran? Mm -hmm. Iran is uh, today producing about 2.4 million barrels per day, the record in the last two uh, years, but still uh, more than 1.5 million barrels per day. Uh, there is an unused capacity there which can uh, come to markets in case uh, there is an agreement between Iran and the uh, 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 international community. How much do you think they're going to have to ramp up supply? How much do you think OPEC is going to have to open up the taps? in a barrels per day kind of way uh, it's up to it is it is up to them uh, to decide how much and if at all they are going to do it but one thing is clear in the absence of uh not uh, changing the policies uh, with the strong growth coming uh, uh, from uh, united states uh, uh, china uh, europe we will see a widening gap which in turn would put uh, further uh, upward pressure uh, on the prices uh, we expected a demand in a one year or so uh, may well come back to the levels of uh, before uh, crisis. Of course, there are many uncertainties we see from India right. uh, the, uh, related to the uh, COVID. But uh, broadly, we expect uh, that the, in one year or uh, a bit later, if the aviation sector comes back uh, uh, slowly but surely to the previous levels, we may see uh, in, the, in one year or so coming right. back to the 2019 uh, levels of oil demand. Fatih, you mentioned India, obviously a major importer of oil. You also have issues in places like yeah. South America, and then international travel still largely is pretty much on hold. So in the near term, is it risky for OPEC to be increasing supply? I mean, risky uh, for whom? Producers or consumers, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, in uh, our numbers show that in the absence of a policy change, uh, increasing the uh, production or other policy changes coming from OPEC uh, countries, uh, with the demand recovering, uh, the current uh, prices, which are already uh, very strong in the last uh, few weeks, may uh, further see uh, upward uh, pressure. Thank you so much, as always, for giving us a little bit of your time, the IEA Executive Director there, Fatih Birol. Now, coming up in the next hour, John Stoltfus, he is Oppenheimer Asset Management Chief Investment Strategist. We look at the markets, we look, of course, at OPEC+, Plus, that alliance meeting at a meeting, a special meeting, a little bit later today, that will probably decide what oil does next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>